see if I did that right. Today's reading is in Genesis 39. If you have your Bibles, you can read along with me, please. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ismaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in the sight and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer over his house and all that he owned and put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him, there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, Fly with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? As she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household were there inside. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and he had fled outside, she called to the men of the household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke with him to, with these words. The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to me and make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him, and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail, so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Thank you. Sal, appreciate that. Ben, thank you so much too, buddy. Um, so this continues week two for us in this series where we are going through the life of Joseph. And I told you guys we were going to be uh, kind of participating in this public reading of Scripture as one of the many ways that God has pre prescribed worship for His people. I think it's a really underutilized method of worship that we don't engage in often enough, but uh, if we were living in uh, Joseph's day or, or uh, Jesus' day, man, this would have been something that would have been done almost every, every single time the, the, the body of, of God come together is that they would read from, read from uh, these big passages out of the Bible together. So, um, anyway, so we're going to be doing that, and I, I told you guys that throughout this Joseph story, um, there are going to be a, a lot of really good lessons that we're going to want to sort of take from it, man. There's a lot of good stuff that, that we could pull from the story that you just heard, and we are going to focus on the story, but I told you guys last week, uh, or if you missed last week, that, that really what we're trying to do is look at the story 
behind the story. I said it's a lot like a, a picture. Uh, if you've ever seen someone stand in front of like Mount Rainier and get their picture taken, what do we, what do we often do? Well, um, you can't really focus on two things that are that far apart. Uh, and so we'll, oftentimes we'll sort of blur out the background and so we can focus on the fore- foreground image, right? Um, and I said that foreground image is a lot like a lot of the good lessons that we could take from this thing. They're, they're there. They're a part of the picture, and there, there's some really good stuff that we can take from that. But, but honestly, I'm actually way more interested in the background image, and that is how Joseph's story points our eyes forward to the story of Jesus. And we looked at that last week. We began this idea of holding to God's promises and how Jesus actually came and brought redemption and salvation as he, as he held to the very promises of his own father. And, uh, and so this week we're going to look at uh, something else uh, along the story of Joseph. And, and there may be a lot of those really good lessons that we just sort of fly over and maybe you, you hope we would, you know, I don't know, dive into uh, the story a little bit more, maybe into uh, why it is that God blessed the house of Potiphar and blessed Joseph in the jail. Or all, and there's all all kinds of really good stuff that we could take, uh, but we're going to kind of, we're going to fly over these things, and we're going to look at the story behind the story this morning. Um, but before we get there, I want to talk about rip currents. Uh, so it's, I've thought about this this week. It's like this is some sort of therapy for me or something, because I've realized the last several times I've talked about things that really scare me or like freak me out, it's all had to do with the ocean. I don't know about you guys, but I'm really proud of the breakthroughs I'm making for myself in this. Like, but but everyone's like the last one we talked about was like tsunamis. I think before that it was like being stranded at sea. I think I told sharks. Yeah, I said something about being. I'm seeing a pattern emerge, and I don't know, man. I think I've got some hangups. So I might need to like see somebody about the ocean. But today we're talking about rip currents, right? And so uh, if you if you've been in like we, we lived in Florida for about six years down the Gulf Coast, and uh, if you've ever been there, then you've probably always seen the signs. Uh, they actually have a special flag that is like rip currents are out. And if you don't know what a rip current is, uh, this is essentially how they work. Um, the beaches are, are really this combination of a couple of sandbars. And there's obviously the big sandbar. That's the beach. That's what we make, you know, sandcastles on or whatever. Uh, and the waves crash against. But, but anywhere from about 200, 300 feet out to maybe Two, three hundred yards out, and there's what they call the second sandbar. Um, and so it's this other, it's other place where the, you know, it might get 20, 30 feet maybe in between the two sandbars, but then it comes up to the second sandbar and, and it sort of acts as this buffer and this barrier that, that keeps the beach from just getting bombarded with, with really hard waves. And so what'll happen though is in a storm or, you know, maybe a strong current comes in or something, but part of that second like part of that second sandbar that keeps the, the beach from getting really badly eroded away will get washed out and it makes this like cavity in the second sandbar. And this acts as this sort of like vacuum that pulls this incredibly strong current right off of the shore. A lot of water can escape through this hole that's in the second sandbar. And if you've ever been there, anybody ever been there, anybody ever been in a rip current before? You know, like divers. Okay, so they're like serious business, right? They're like you don't you don't joke around with the rip current. And really, it's more like for the kids because like you can be there and all of a sudden the kid is just like whew, gone, you know. Especially if they're like floating on something. That's that's bad. That's dangerous, right? Uh, and and so here, here's what happens: they they tell you, and if you've seen the signs at the beach, they actually have signs explaining how to get out of a rip current, don't they? And it's because we typically, when we panic, we choose one of two really bad options. And uh, the first option is we're like, well, we'll just sort of wait this out. And so we kick our feet up and we go with the current flow. Good idea, bad idea. But bad idea, right? Because like maybe it ends just right offshore or maybe that thing goes on for a half mile. Like you don't know, like it could terminate way, way out at sea. And if you're not a good swimmer, that could potentially be a death, you know, death sentence there. Um, and the other bad option that we sometimes choose is we freak out and we turn around and we try to swim towards shore as hard as we can, don't we? And like if you're a really good swimmer, um, you doesn't take you long to realize that you're not that good of a swimmer, right? Uh, and so, what uh, what's what's the third option that it that it calls us to? If you've seen the signs, what, what are you what are you supposed to do to get out of rip current? Swim sideways, right? Like kind of counterintuitive, really, like to what maybe would come natural if you're in that in that position, but swim sideways. Um, so, w- what in the world? Why why rip currents uh, this morning? Um, we'll, we'll come back to them, but but I want to talk about. 
I want to talk about Babylon, and I want to talk about Egypt for just a second. Um, and, then, and then rip currents will really, really make sense and why, why we chose that, right? Now, I want to talk about this idea of, of the nation of Babylon. And Babylon was a real place. Uh, it, was a, it was a place that God sent his people into exile. Um, but, but it's really so, so much more than that. If you come and you read all the way to the end of the Bible, then you realize Babylon actually becomes this sort of moniker for any of the world systems that set itself up sort of in opposition to God, right? The God's kingdom has this set of morals, this set of values, this construct of thing that, things that it values and, and holds really dear to itself. And then what happens is man who gets to define good and evil by his own volition, right, will typically always define that in a way that best benefits them. Leads to their pleasure, leads to their success, their fulfillment, whatever the case. And, uh, and at the end of the day, it leads us to create this system that is called Babylon. It's called the world. It's called Egypt. It's whatever. Like, like, but, but, the, but the name that the Bible used most to talk about this is Babylon. And it doesn't necessarily just mean Babylon because Egypt, in Joseph's story, is Babylon. A Canaan was was Babylon. It was defined by these sort of values that have set itself up and opposed itself to God. Um, even Israel, like God's chosen people at one point, become Babylon. And so what he does is he's like, all right, you want to live as Babylon? I'll let you live as Babylon. And he lets them go into exile in Babylon. And they realize actually that the fruit of that isn't very good. They don't, they don't actually like that at all. And then you come to the end of the story, like you, you, come, to, you come to Jesus' day, Rome, it's pictured again as, as Babylon, right? And so here's the deal. Um, here, here's why I'm particularly proud of my rip current example. Um, is if you, if you look in the Bible, um, Babylon is directly associated with the sea. So you can check this out for yourself. Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 18. You can look at either one of those. And they really highlight this, this sort of emphasize this idea that Babylon is the sea and all that, right? Um, and all those, it just found in those two chapters, it's, it's really, it's really, really, big sea imagery associated with Babylon in those chapters. But here's the deal. The sea is seen as this place of chaos and death in the biblical story. It's the very thing that Babylon uses to gain, to keep, and to assert its power over those that it would assert its power over. Meanwhile, the land, it is seen as this place of beauty, tranquility, and order. That's why, um, that, so, so that would be God's kingdom, right? The land would be God's kingdom. The sea is the kingdom of Babylon. You guys, everybody tracking along with sort of the, the imagery here, right? Babylon is the sea and all this good stuff. And that's why John, John the Revelator, as he talks about the end of the Bible story, the day when Babylon is actually defeated, um, and, he, and he begins to describe what this new kingdom looks like, this new creation. Here's, here's what he says about it. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Here's what he says. Then he saw, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, the first heaven and the first earth, had passed away. And check this out. And there's no longer any sea. So here's the deal. It isn't necessarily that there isn't going to be an ocean in the new creation, right? Um, but it's this idea that there, there actually won't be any vestments of that old system. The system where might makes right and the one with the biggest stick makes the rules. Where everyone sort of gets to define good and evil for themselves and then live out that definition as they sort of see fit, right? That, that's not there anymore. So here's the deal. I want you to picture... I want you to picture our sin and our brokenness like a rock being thrown into the surface of like a really glassy, smooth pond. Like, yeah, man, the initial act may be violent, but the reality is, is that the ripple effects and what, what that causes after that goes on long after the initial event, right? We, we kind of know this to be true. And so Babylon is this place. Imagine that, like you do that once and it really disrupts the water, Right? But we don't just do it once, do we? We make these choices to redefine good and evil in our own sort of definition and live in light of that definition multiple times every day. And then multiply that image by like 7 billion people. And then you can begin to see why Babylon is sort of like this chaotic and deadly sea. Is everybody tracking sort of the imagery that goes into this? Everybody, everybody good with that, right? It's dozens of little choices that people make every single day that ultimately have one thing in their aim. And as they're flourishing and moving them up the ladder, whether that be the corporate ladder, the financial ladder, the social 
ladder, or the ladder of pleasure, the ladder of self-actualization or fulfillment. And people will lie, cheat, steal, step on other people, use their position for their benefit, right, to climb that ladder. When you look at the collective humanity doing that, right, chaotic and turbulent seas becomes a really great metaphor for the kingdom of this world, right? And yet, check this out, in this current age, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are pictured as this sort of stranger, alien, foreigner in this, in this foreign land, right? That this isn't actually your home. That if you've chosen to follow Jesus, Colossians chapter 1 tells us that you've actually been transferred to a new kingdom. You've sort of been plucked out of the sea and yet not entirely, right? Go, going back to our rip, rip current example, we don't yet fully live on the beach because God's kingdom hasn't come in its fullness yet, has it, right? Like, there's still war and cancer and brokenness and divorce and like, like th- those things still exist in the world. Like we still experience the chaotic seas of brokenness and death and decay, right? And so it hasn't come in its fullness yet. So there's still very much a sea in the current age, but our feet, if we are followers of Jesus who have been transferred to this new kingdom, like our feet are supposed to remain grounded in God's kingdom as we remain close to the shore, Everybody still tracking the metaphor? Good. Everybody good with this, right? This is this is my like I wish I was super creative and could come up with this, but it's not not my metaphor, right? This is the Bible's metaphor for for this, right? It's like we're wading in waist deep water. Our feet are still grounded on the land, but we have to live in this sort of constant tension of the current of this world trying to pull us out into deeper and deeper waters. And we're going to look at several stories this morning. We're going to look at Joseph, right? We just heard Joseph's story read. We're going to look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You guys heard of them before, right? We're going to look at Daniel. We're going to look even at, at Esther. And here's the deal about these characters. They all live in Babylon. Joseph lives in Egypt. But again, just another name for Babylon, right? Several of them, actually all of them, take Babylonian or Egyptian names. Joseph is going to eventually be called Zaphonath Paneah. Did you guys know that? That he actually gets renamed. It's an Egyptian name. So they live in Babylon. They take Babylonian names. They learn the languages of Babylon. They participate in the culture of Babylon up to an extent. right? And and get this, they even hold high-ranking jobs in Babylon and Egypt. I'm like, dude, Joseph is second in command. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, second, third, fourth, and fifth in command in Babylon. Like Esther, Esther is the queen of Babylon, for goodness sakes, right? And here's the deal. None of that is seen as being unfaithful to God. None of that is seen as being unfaithful to God. And yet, man, this is it's like really good news because guess what? You live in Babylon. You raise your children in Babylon. You, you go to the grocery store in Babylon. Your, your, neighbor is, is it, your neighborhood is in Babylon. Like you, you go to the baseball, your baseball games in Babylon. Like, like this, is, this is the place you live and work participate in the culture and the things around us. This is where we are. And yet, there are these moments, just like in Joseph's story, that, just like the one that, that Al just read for us, and in Daniel's story, and Esther, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? That they're faced with these rip-current moments where the culture and the ethics and the morals of Babylon run completely counter to God's kingdom, and when it tries with all its might to drag you out to see with it. And we just seen the one in Joseph's story, right? It was something that he was accused of that he actually didn't even do. And he takes like this unjust punishment and he's like he's thrown into prison like un- like what wasn't right what happened to him and, and sometimes sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's false accusations. Sometimes it is persecution, right? But but the reality is I find those instances actually fairly Fairly rare. However, I, I think we, we like to imagine they happen a lot more often than they do. But th- those are actually fairly, fairly rare instances. More, more often than not, it's these big cultural issues of our day. Political issues. Things like abortion. Things like sexual ethics or views on marriage and divorce. Ideas about gender. Or a thousand other enormous social issues of our day. Anybody familiar with any of those? Any of those made the news in the last week? Yeah, probably, right? If Actually, probably all of them have made the news in the last week. But, and maybe you think that you know how to navigate those rip currents, 
maybe you've, maybe you've got circles of friends that you can sort of exist in sort of the shallow end with, and you can sort of, maybe you've convinced yourself you can keep your feet on the ground over those issues, right? Chances are, if you haven't felt the pull of those issues, then you're not associating with the type of people that Jesus would have us to associate with, right? That we're, we're not reaching, we're not carrying out the mission, because the mission of Jesus carries us into places where the cultural currents around those issues are incredibly strong. But more often than not, actually, it's these smaller, more personal rip currents that we find ourselves in. And they're really, really good at dragging us out to sea. Right? Let me just give you a few examples. It's the small moral lines that we're willing to cross to get ahead. It's the ethical gray areas that we're willing to exploit to allow our businesses, our finances, our friendships and relationships, whatever, to succeed. It's the white lie that we're willing to tell. It's the little injustices that we're willing to overlook, right? So as to not like rock the boat or to be seen as maybe too liberal or too conservative by the right people or wrong people or whatever, right? It's the sins of a friend or a boss that we will not bring into the light, right? Because man, maybe that means we risk losing that friendship or maybe our job or maybe even more severe like, like repercussions. It's that broken and sinful thing that we do so long as we think that it can be done in secret. Because ultimately, that thing leads to my pleasure, my satisfaction, my success, and my fulfillment. And why we would, while we would never reduce it down to language quite as trite as that, that's, that's really what happens in us when we do this. I'll give you an example of something in my own, own story that has like always bothered me. And I'm like out of the military now, so I can, I can totally rail against it for a second. Um, an example of something, something that's always bothered me. Um, annual performance reports. Love them, hate them. Yeah, da- thumbs down all the way, right? Uh, and, and here's why. You work all year long, you volunteer, you go to school, and at the end of the year, you get two pages. Was it 18 lines? I think it is. You get 18 lines to like tell your boss what you did, right? And you have to capture it, and you only have like this much space. Every character, every space counts. Like you have to, you guys are laughing because you write them and you, you see them come to you, and they're, they're terrible, right? And what happens when we do this? It's like, we'll, we actually, we'll probably write them fairly honestly. No, I mean, like, nobody just, well, m- most people don't go out just seeking to lie about what they did over the last year, right? And so you try to capture this thing honestly, but then what happens to it? When it leaves your desk, where does it go? It goes to your boss, right? And then where does it leave? It, it leaves his desk and goes to his boss. And what happens when it leaves those desks? What happens? It gets corrected. To sound better, right? That's, that's always the thing that happens. You're corrected to sound better. And then when it comes back to you and you read this thing, you're like, bro, I don't know who this guy is, but he did some awesome stuff this year, right? It's like not even, it's not a true reflection of who you are or what you've done, right? So here's the question. Like, you can rail against this, but, but the reality is, what would happen if you actually wrote your performance report honestly to be a true reflection? Dude, you would never get promoted, would you? Right? Like the whole, the entire system supports this sort of like stretching the truth, half truths and all out lies, right? And, and yet if you were to be honest and you were to try to come in and do something, like dude, you would never get promoted. And then what happens is like you get promoted and you're like, yeah, this feels really good, right? And it's like, and it does in one sense, but there's another sense that you know that you sat on a throne of lies, right? And it's like this like total like half truth is what got you to where you are. And, and, and like, obviously there's a little bit of hyperbole mixed in that, but not, not much at all, right? The reality is that we're all faced with these little rip currents every single day that give us the opportunity to either identify with the kingdom of God or succeed. And it's oftentimes that black and white, isn't it? That maybe to follow God and His kingdom, to do what is right, morally, ethically, whatever the case is, to make the honest choice, like, dude, it costs us. That often to follow Jesus and His kingdom, ethics and values means serious repercussions in the systems of this world. And so the question becomes, And the question I think we see answered in Joseph's life and in his story that that Al just read for us is this. Is which kingdom reality are you truly committed to? Feet on the sand or floating out in the waters, right? I think to answer that question, we actually have to answer another question. Um, It says, how do we handle moments of compromise where we must choose between living as faithful citizens of God's kingdom, 
in the allure of success, pleasure, fulfillment, whatever else you want to throw in there, right? That may come if we give ourselves over to the kingdom of this world. This is the rip current moment, right? And here's why I chose rip currents for this, because typically what people do, what I've watched as followers of Jesus do all the time, is they do one of two really wrong things. Is they kick their feet up, and they go with the current, like the cultural current that sweeps them out to sea, or they like rage against the system, and like do war and go to battle with Babylon, right? And either one of those ends up in people getting drowned. It's not a good thing. There has to be some good and right third option. And so here's, here's the deal. I, I want to look at Joseph's story from the perspective of the what if this morning. You guys heard the real story, right? That Al read the real story, nothing doctored about that. But I've sort of doctored a, a second version of the story a couple of times. So we're going to look at this story from the perspective of the what if. And I want to learn some things from what happens if Joseph kicks his feet up and goes with the flow, or what happens if Joseph like rages against the man and like goes to war with Potiphar in Egypt and all that. And here, here's what's going to happen is we're going to learn some really good things from this. You guys guys ready? You guys ready? All right, here we go. The first bad decision that people make is to simply kick up their feet and go with the current. It's a sort of win in Rome mentality. This is the world we live in. Sexual ethics have changed, right? We've become supposedly smarter over our time and our cultural views and all these moral and ethical issues have changed. We have the option to either buy that lie and change with it or Evaluate the repercussions of going against the current, right, and, and, and swim against it. Whether that's the big issues or small cultural issue, doesn't really matter, right? People get washed out to sea all the time and went, wind up walking away from God and away from their faith as they are drowned in the sea of cultural relativity in the pursuits of self-interest. What would Joseph's story look like if he had kicked his feet up? So I've, I've sort of rewritten some things in this. You'll, you'll notice that they'll be italicized. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you guys know. So this is a, this is a good point when, to have your own Bible, so you can kind of compare these two. Here it is, Genesis chapter 39. We're going to read some stuff. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, uh, with me, here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There's no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife, right? How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? And he's like doing really pretty good up to this point, right? But as she spoke to Joseph day after day, this time he doesn't rebuff her, right? As she spoke to Joseph day after day, though, he broke down and he gave in in a moment of weakness. That's the Devon paraphrase, right? Now, it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and sort of compromised resolve meets opportunity in this moment. None of the men were in the household, right? They weren't inside. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he slept with Potiphar's wife. And they kept it a secret for many years. Now, um, let's just stop the story right there, right? Joseph's, because at that moment, Joseph's story essentially would stop. Now, now obviously, we know that that's not what happened in the story, right? The, the real story, he says no, and he says no again and again and again. And finally, she tries to be forceful with him, and he runs out of the house, and he leaves his coat with her, and she accuses him and makes up this big grand story to sort of cover her own self uh, when her husband comes back home. And it, it gets Joseph thrown into prison, right? And actually, things go really well for Joseph in prison, as good as they can for somebody in prison. And uh, he rises to power there in prison, and, and then he gets released from prison. He has this amazing meeting with Pharaoh, and he saves Egypt, and he saves his brothers, and everything really wins in the end. It's good, right? We sort of talked about that story last week, but that, that's the real story. But let's just play out that what if for just a second, right? Maybe... Maybe he keeps it a secret for a really long time and he never gets caught, right? Maybe he lives out his days there in Potiphar's house. He dies old with this big secret about the time that he slept with Potiphar's wife, right? And maybe he goes back and he, he thinks about that every time that Potiphar is like being really mean or nasty to him. Like, yeah, bro, you know what I, what I did, right? Like, and so maybe he like hangs on to that. More likely, Potiphar probably catches the two of them and it would end in Joseph being killed, right? Right? 
Um, or perhaps he goes lenient on Joseph and, and Joseph still ends up in prison, right? Probably not very likely. But either way you slice that story, Joseph likely misses the encounter with the Pharaoh and a disastrous famine wipes him and his entire family of, like off the map. Doesn't end well, right? What if he misses that like divine appointment with Pharaoh? How, how does that go for the nation of Israel? Not, like, not good, right? God sends a famine, it gets nasty, they all die. Now, here's the deal. That is obviously all speculation, right? Like just forthright. That's obviously all speculation. But, but let me tell you an effect of that what if that, that isn't speculation at all. It comes in the form of a question. Was it difficult for Joseph to do the right thing when there were several witnesses to his actions and when the cost was incredibly high? Was it difficult? Yeah, bro, you're going to prison, right? <laughs> like, like there, there are people around like, like dude, that, that, was, that was rough. That was a difficult, that was a difficult thing to like, do, right? And, and maybe she was like beautiful. Maybe, maybe he thought she was beautiful. And maybe he had like maybe sent some eyes her direction or something for a while. And like all of a sudden the stars align and dude, she's into me and like that he'll never know, right? What was it? Was it difficult? Maybe he hated Potiphar. And maybe this was like a way you could have got back at Potiphar, right? Like maybe, maybe it's like, bro, I'm, I'm like going to totally stick it to you. And, and so maybe he goes and, and he's going to do this thing, right? But needless to say, it was difficult. It was a difficult decision, but, but here's the deal. Was there ever a moment in Joseph's story where he could have chosen to do the wrong thing? Don't miss this. And not only would it not have been costly, but he actually would have been justified in the eyes of some witnesses. Think about this for a second. We haven't got to this part in the story, but there comes a moment towards the end of Joseph's story. Sorry, this thing's bugging me to death. Um, there comes this moment at the end of Joseph's story where he, uh, he meets with his brothers again. And they come back, and he sort of like toys with them a little bit to see if they had changed their murderous ways or not. This is when he is second in command in Egypt, right? He toys with them to see if they had sort of like changed their murderous ways or not. So he, he throws them in prison, and he kind of does a few things to like sort of test where they're at. And, uh, and man, what we learn from that is like, dude, it would have been really easy for Joseph to just kill those guys. Like, dude, he throws them into prison and no one bats an eye. He could have had them executed. And when they said, dude, why did you do that? Well, actually, let me tell you why I did that. Because they, they threatened to kill me and they sold me into slavery. Like, I wouldn't even be here right now if it weren't for the actions of these. I, er, dude, everybody would have been like, yeah, bro, good, good on you, man. You know, like, like you, you did what, what you needed to do in that moment. Like, he would have been completely justified in that story. Their lives were in Joseph's hands, and he could have easily justified killing them with basically zero consequences. I mean, he was good. His family was in Egypt. He was taken care of, man. He had a wife and kids and a cushy palace job. Dude, he could have annihilated them. His father would have never known what happened to him. Would that have made it right? It's tough. We see this moment where G Joseph is being tried by fire to produce the type of character necessary to make a real choice of consequence later in life. One that would greatly affect God's redemptive plan for all mankind. Now, let's consider what the book of James says for just a second. James 1, 2-4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Y'all listen to me in this. God was working through the rip current to produce a strength of character in Joseph that would go on to have enormous effects in the world around him. Man, through Joseph's story, we see what is really valuable in God's kingdom. And it's this, it's strong character, forged in the fire, fires of trial and adversity. What we choose to do in those moments of compromise shape us for the better or for the worst. Let's go back to that, that rock example of our sin being thrown into this like glassy smooth pond. Like that, those ripples go far beyond we can ever imagine. And yet, like when we choose not to just put our feet up and go with the flow, our character, 
That eternal part of ourselves like that will, that will go on to exist forever is like shaped and molded into something that God values greatly in His kingdom. Dude, the stakes are too far high for what it does to our soul and our mind. Our response to good and evil and how we allow God to define those things for us. Like, dude, the stakes are too high for even the widest of lies. The stakes are way too high to to live in the sort of moral or ethical gray area that allows us to sort of massage things to our benefit because the reality is that's how Babylon acts, right? We're running out of time, so let's move on to the second thing, right? If the first bad choice people make is to kick their feet up, then the second bad choice that people make when caught in the rip current is to try and swim against the current. I watch as followers of Jesus like rail against the system, right? They wage war against Babylon. It sounds a lot like this. Man, we need to stand up and fight for blank. Insert the thing. Have you heard anything that sounded like that over the last year? Yeah, yeah. We, we've all, we, okay, we, we need to stand up and fight for this thing, this initiative, this bill, this whatever, this politician, this like, insert whatever that thing is there. This is the equivalent of trying to swim against the current, and y'all look at me right here, like don't, don't miss this, Babylon will crush you. Babylon will crush you hands down, right? Like, let's, let's go to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's, let's just go to their example, right? Fiery furnace, those guys, right? The, don't in the lion's den, everybody pretty familiar with that story, right? Um, they, they ascend to power there in Babylon, And they come to one of these rip current moments where they have to decide if they're going to bow the knee to Nebuchadnezzar or if they're going to stand firm in their faith. If they're going to bow the knee and eat the king's food or if they're going to stay faithful to what God has commanded them. They're going to stay faithful in their worship as they pray to God or if they're going to bow the knee to... right. And so there comes this rip current moment where Babylon tries to suck them out to sea and they have to make this decision. And man, we see as everyone else bows the knee, man. They pull their feet up and they go along with the current. What if, what if Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, however, had used their position and their proximity to Nebuchadnezzar to, like, assassinate him? Like, like, dude, we know this thing's coming, and they just, like, stab him in the back before it ever happened. Well, we would have never got Nebuchadnezzar's words, because, man, actually something amazing happened out of those interactions. We see a change of heart in Nebuchadnezzar that, that he like pushes out to the entire like world. He's the, he was the most powerful guy in the world at that time. Look, look at one of the things he says. Daniel chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. He says, It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. This comes after their rebellion. Not after they tried to assassinate him, right? How great are his signs, meaning God's, and how mighty are his wonders his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. What if, what if like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had like rebelled and like, dude, we're going to assassinate the king instead. We're going to go to war with Babylon. Bro, they would have been crushed. They chose the swim sideways option. We're going to look at that here in just a second. They chose, they chose option three though and look what it led to. What about Queen Esther? You know that story. Story of like racial... Oppression. The entire Jewish nation is like about to be slaughtered by this secret plot that is coming up behind the scenes. And Esther has come to this place where she's the queen of Babylon, man. But she has this moment where she can step in and risk her life to maybe save her people, or she can remain silent and she can like maybe things work out okay for her. It's a rip current moment, right? What if instead of proceeding the way that she did, and I encourage you to read that story if you've not. What if she had poisoned Haman, the guy who was responsible for the genocide? Like, like, like when she hosted the feast for the king and for Haman, what if instead of like letting Haman literally build his own gallows and tie his own noose, like which she did, like what if instead of that she would have poisoned him at the dinner? Like what would have happened in that moment, right? It's likely that Esther would have been killed as a traitor to the throne. And the Jewish genocide would have proceeded with mass casualties. What about Joseph? Let's, let's go to the what if in his scenario. What if he set a trap for Potiphar's wife? What if he come and he brought things to Potiphar's attention? What if he like tried to stand up and fight for himself and he called her every name in the book and said, no, this is what she did and, and like I've got witnesses and all. Like, what if he would have tried to have fought that? We're right back where we were in the first scenario, right? Like he misses the appointment. He doesn't work out well. Maybe he gets killed. Potiphar says, dude, you're going to accuse my wife of what? And that's it for Joseph, right? Like, like any number of things, but it doesn't end up the way that it, 
that it was supposed to. Let me give you an example from the New Testament. I think this sort of leads us into our, um, kind of towards our conclusion. He said, what about Paul? I get, I get asked, asked this question a lot. Um, why didn't Paul and the other New Testament writers rail against slavery and just outright call it by the evil that it was? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever had that question? Or have you ever thought, like, why doesn't Paul and why doesn't, why doesn't like, the New Testament rail against slavery? As You know, right? The short answer to that question is that while Rome was fairly tolerant to new and emerging religions, um, they were not tolerant at all to anything that smelled like a, a slave revolt, right? I mean, they would have turned every resource at their disposal against Paul and the Christian movement if they thought one of the aims of that movement was to free the slaves of Rome. But check this out, y'all. Paul actually does something way more effective and way more subversive as he realigns the relationship between slaves and masters. He makes them equals. He makes them responsible to the same ultimate master that they are both accountable to. He nullifies the hierarchy that allowed slavery to exist in this sort of like long game, right? And it touched so much more than slavery. It touched workers' rights. It touched women's rights. The status of women, children, widows, and orphans the dynamic between the rich and the poor, and so, so much more, right? Jesus, Paul, the other New Testament figures were incredibly subversive to the system, right, of Babylon. But it's how they dealt with it. It's how they and how Joseph, like, waged war that was like, that was what we need to take our example. Because here's the deal. We are in a war. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 tells us that like without question. Here, here's what Paul says about that war against Babylon. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Look, look at me really closely. We are at war. It's not with people. It's not with politicians or bills or legislature. It's not with your boss. It's not with that person who has done you wrong. It's not with those people who hold different sexual ethics or views of marriage or gender. Or those advocating for abortion or trying to take prayer out of schools, right? It's not like we're not at war against some hyper-liberal or regressive conservative agenda. Like, you're not at war with any of those things. You, you are at war with Babylon, And Babylon is only Babylon because it is filled with people committed to her through choosing to define good and evil in a way that best benefits them. Check check this out. At its roots, Babylon is only Babylon because of sin, and we are at war with sin. Paul's words about that type of war that we're to wage comes right before a list of weapons and armor that we're supposed to have. Anybody familiar with that passage? The whole armor of God passage, right? But, but here's the deal. They're, they're, not, they're not pieces of armor, and they're not weapons that you would find on any traditional battle, battlefield. And the idea is that if we use the same weapons and the same tactics that the world uses, then we're no different than the world. No, man, we are, we are in a fight against Babylon, against sin, actually. But, but in this fight, we have truth, Righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, prayer, and God's word at our disposal. And if you've ever read through that list, then here's what you know. All of those are defensive mechanisms that keep us from being sucked out to sea, except for one. We have one thing. We have a sword with us, right? And it's God's word. God's Word isn't a weapon that we wield by beating people over the head with a list of moral imperatives. God's Word is a unified story that leads to Jesus as the hope of the world and the ultimate conqueror of Babylon and sin. I told you guys last week we were going to look at the story behind the story. Right? And so I want to look at the story behind the story. Matthew chapter 4 is the story of Jesus' own testing. Just as Joseph was tested alone and cut off from everyone in the wilderness of his story, so 
was Jesus. Just as Joseph could have shortcut God's plan for his life and for the redemption of many people and taken a hold of success, satisfaction, or pleasure by sleeping with Potiphar's wife, Jesus was faced with the same choice to compromise and shortcut God's plan of redemption by bowing the knee to Satan. Here's, here's how the story ends. Matthew 4, and we'll close out. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Satan and Jesus in the wilderness, and he takes him up to this high mountain, and he says to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Man, Satan was offering Jesus the very thing that he came to earth to reclaim. All the kingdoms of the earth. This is, why, this is why Jesus came back to earth, was to reclaim the kingdom that was originally his back to himself. But Satan was offering it without having to go to the cross. Just bow the knee, man, and you can avoid the cross. Dude, this is a rip current. This was a real, like, I don't know if you've heard about Roman crucifixion, but that's a rip current, right? Like, dude, if I can get the very thing that I came for without having to die on a Roman cross, right? Like, dude, that's, that's temptation. And it comes back up, actually, later in Jesus' life, and it's way more sinister and way smoother this go-around. Like, it's pretty on the nose the first time, but the second time, man, this is, this is crazy. Jesus has this incredible, like, mountaintop experience with his followers, and he's there, and he's in front of this big wall of idols, and he asks his, his disciples in front of all these other gods, like, who do you say that I am? And they give this amazing response, like, man, you, you, are, um, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and they like, recognize who Jesus is. And, and then he goes on, and, and here's how the story like, continues. Right after this like, really high mountaintop moment, it says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And so then Peter, like doing a typical Peter thing, takes him aside, and he begins to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And in this moment, man, there's the voice of that serpent. Yeah, man, like, like there's the voice of Satan in the wilderness that crops his evil head back up. But this time, it's using Peter as his, like, as his mouthpiece and so he turns to Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. I think Peter was offering Jesus two things. And there are two options that we've already looked at. First, is that Jesus would institute his kingdom in some way that didn't end in him dying. Right? Like Maybe let's just like, bring about social reform, or let's just bring about what, you know, like let's, just, let's just call people to a higher standard, or whatever the case, but like, man, you don't, you don't really have to die, right? And, and, and this is the equivalent of, of Jesus just kicking his feet up and going with the, the flow. Or two, Peter had in mind that Jesus would lead this sort of messianic military movement to overthrow Rome in this act of war. And yet, that wasn't God's plan either. And there were a lot of people that were really confused because that wasn't, that wasn't how Jesus did things. Jesus took a third option. And listen to what Jesus says as he's being accused. He answered and he says, and this is Jesus fixing to be crucified. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not... Of this realm. That's why Jesus was able to recognize that voice in Peter. That's how he was able to recognize the sort of rip current that he had just stepped into, right? The, is that man, he was, he was offering very like Babylonian solutions to a problem that's actually very otherworldly. Jesus came to deal with the real problem our sin. Jesus came to fight the battle against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And Jesus did this by rejecting the temptation in the wilderness that every single one of us has actually fallen victim to. Like he, he, he chose option three and swam sideways out of the rip current when, when all of us have chosen the, the two bad options, actually. 
Every single person in this world has fallen prey to the rip current as we have chosen to define good and evil for ourselves. And so Jesus, as this greater, Moses, as, as this greater Joseph, comes to live the life that none of us could live. Jesus comes to reject not just the calls of Potiphar's wife, but of every, every single sin ever committed. And then like Joseph, Jesus takes the undeserved punishment that would lead to our salvation. It is as you place your faith in Jesus and the life that He lived on your behalf and the punishment that He took on your behalf that He pulls you out of the rip current and He places your feet back on the sands of His kingdom. And if you've chosen to follow Jesus, you know that, you know that you're still subject to the same currents. Right? Like, like, we're not in that kingdom fully. You haven't beat it. Like, there are still temptations, there's still addictions, there's still broken patterns of thought and action. Like, there's still terrible things that you say. Like, you're still, like, you still get caught in these rip currents, like, all the time. Yet, yeah, if we're going to successfully navigate the rip current, it's like someone else, like, like we need a lifeline. Because we instinctively do one of two things. And we rage against the man, and we rage against Babylon, and we try to fight it. And that just has us end up using the same weapons that Babylon. Like, we're no different than them at that point. Or we pick our feet up, and we go with the flow, and either one of those winds up with us being drowned out to sea. We need something else. And we're not smart enough to swim sideways across the current, right? We need a lifeline. And that is the life that Jesus lived on our behalf and the things and the way that he lived that we have failed to at every single turn. If you're going to successfully navigate the rip currents, it will only be as you go back to the gospel that saved you and cry out once again for the power of Jesus to do something in you that you can't do in yourself. It's truth and righteousness. It's the gospel of peace and faith and salvation and prayer that keeps your feet keeps you from kicking your feet up and going with the current. And the hope of Jesus given to us through God's Word is the weapon that allows us to fight the current the right way. And it actually leads to real change, real revolution, subversion to Babylon that actually leads to something really good. And it doesn't come from us fighting better, electing the right people or whatever. Like It, it, comes, it comes as we give the world... The sword. That sword is the hope that's found in Jesus because he's the only one that is capable of defeating Babylon. That's how the story ends, right? It isn't with us like amassing an army big enough to go like take out the army of Babylon. No, do we sit and we watch from the sidelines? I don't know if you realize that, but that's how Babylon, that's how Babylon ends, right? It isn't with us going to war. It it just Jesus comes and He says a couple words and that's it. It's over. And we watch from the sidelines. As helpless as we have been all along, right? So I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're here and you're hearing this for the very first time and you need to go back. Maybe you need to go to Jesus for the very first time. And allow Him to deliver you from the rip current. And man, it is as easy as crying out, like, God, save me. Forgive me, and I choose to follow after you. And you can do that right where you're sitting. Maybe you're here, and you're right in the middle of a rip current. Maybe you're afraid that you've like been picked up, and you're being swept out to shore, and you don't know what to do about it. Maybe, maybe it's sin in your own brokenness, or maybe it's just the rip current of other people's sin and brokenness that has picked you up and is like carrying you and falsely accusing you, just like Joseph, right? That the world we live in, it isn't always your own doing, right? Like there are seven billion people that are creating rip currents and maybe you're caught in one of those man the, the power isn't to just go with the flow and it isn't and it isn't to fight with all that you've got the power is to go back to the gospel that saved you and allow for its lifeline to pull you out once again to go back and believe that message that jesus can do and wants to do something in you and through you that you're not capable of doing yourself and something begins to happen in that moment Lifeline comes out and things begin to change. Jesus changes hearts and minds, circumstances. He changes things that, that we have no ability to control or change. And so, man, I invite you wherever you're wherever you walked in here at, 
to go back to the gospel with me. Will you do that as I close this out in prayer? Father, we love you. We praise you. God, I am broken, sinful, and I do things every single day, multiple times a day, and I, it's like I forget. It's like I forget who you are. I lose sight of the joy of my own salvation at times and get caught up in the rip current. God, you, you just know some of the personal things even that I'm, that I'm dealing through and I've got, got in my own heart, my own life right now. God, and I, just, I, just, I just can't. God, I, I need you. I know that our, our people, that people in these chairs, that, that they need you to do something that, that we can't do for ourselves. I need your strength, your wisdom. Father, we submit. We submit to whatever the trial may be because, God, I know that even in this, you may be working a strength and a resolve of character, God, that wouldn't come otherwise. And, God, that doesn't make it easier. God, I submit. Love you, praise you, and I lean on your strength today and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. You guys have a great week, and thank you so much for being here this week. Take it easy.